A little lock is just like a hardcore Nuzlocke, where any Pokemon that faints has to be boxed forever, and I only get to catch the first Pokemon I find per route. Except, I can't use any final evolutions, eliminating all of the strongest Pokemon in the game. Also, I still can't use any items from the bag in battle or level past the next gym leader. With the rules in place, the run starts like any other Sinnoh Nuzlocke. I contemplate picking Turtwig, since its bulk and access to Curse might make it the best option. But in the end, I settle for Chimchar, since firefighting is so good in Sinnoh. The timid nature is not so good. All of Monferno's best moves are physical, so this sucks. From there, we get a very normal start in Sinnoh. At Lake Verity, I pick up Potatoes the Bidoof, who's never gonna evolve, just the way Arceus intended. I then head to Route 202, where, you guessed it, I find a Starly. I can go fishing on Route 218 to find a Magikarp, but without being able to evolve, this thing is literally useless. The same goes for my encounter on Route 204, a Cricketot, which, don't get me wrong, is useless even if you can evolve it. My luck on Route 203 is a lot better since I find an Abra. Normally, it's a huge gamble whether or not you can catch this thing since you only get one chance. But since Chimchar learns Taunt at like level 9, we can stop it from teleporting away, giving us as many chances as it takes to throw Pokeballs at this thing until it's finally caught. And while Abra's even more useless than Magikarp and Cricketot at the moment, Kadabra's not outright broken like Alakazam, but it might just be the best Pokemon we get access to. I then move on through Orber Gate, where I encounter Lemon the Psyduck. Once I reach the city, I make sure to go north to Route 207 and pick up a Machop. And once down in the mine, I very predictably find a Geodude. Then while training my team to the level cap in preparation for the first gym, Nuggets evolves into Staravia and Burrito into Monferno. And considering these will be their final base stats for the rest of the game, I'm a little bit concerned. What I'm definitely not concerned about, however, is Rourke. His first two Pokemon are so cripplingly weak to water, all it takes is for Lemon to spit on them a bit, and he's down to his final Pokemon. This thing's attack is pretty serious, so Headbutt does deal some good damage, forcing me to swap out into Burrito after connecting with a water gun. As I do, Rourke the Dork uses a potion, which means I have to use two mock punches to get my badge. Moving through Ravaged Path, I find another great encounter in Zubat, and with the level cap now higher than 16, Fry's already evolves into Kadabra. With the main restriction of this challenge, the difficulty is going to increase exponentially the further we get into the game. But here in the early game, since we wouldn't have access to very many final evolutions anyway, and the opponents we face are scaled to our current power level, Early game bosses like Mars aren't too big a problem. After Fries takes out Zubat with a single confusion, I swap out into Meatball, who can pretty much tank anything this per ugly throws at it because of its massive bulk. Having access to a Geodude or an Onyx in this fight pretty much makes it completely free, and even without either of them, Monferno does incredibly well in this fight. Once I've taken Cheryl through the forest, she gives me a Soothe Bell, which is actually really useful for the next encounter I find, a Badoo. And because the level cap's at exactly 22, we can just barely get Zubat to evolve into Golbat. This is perfect timing going into the fight versus Gardenia. Already, Staravia and Monferno pretty much counter her entire team, but with its poison and flying typing, Golbat quad resists grass. Annoyingly, a single wing attack isn't enough to take out Turtwig, which allows it to set up Reflect. Which means after a super potion, another two wing attacks aren't even enough to take Turtwig out, allowing it to set up the sun. In a way, this actually helps me out more than it helps out her. Once Turtwig is defeated, she sends in Cherum, and because of the sun, it's turned into its slightly better form. Because of Turtwig's Reflect, I'm still doing pretty pitiful damage, and decide after I get Leech Seeded to swap out into Monferno to utilize that Sun. At this point, Reflect is worn off, and this is the last turn of Sun, so sadly, I'm not gonna have the double boost to fire once I face Roserade. This does end up making a difference, since without the Sun, my Flame Wheel isn't enough to take Roserade out, only activating its Citrus Berry. I'm then paralyzed with Stun Spore, but unlike in BDSP, this Roserade doesn't have extra sensory, so Monferno isn't really in any real danger, meaning I can stay in despite being paralyzed, connecting with a flame wheel the next turn, which grants me our second gym badge. With Gardenia defeated, we're now able to cut down trees, giving us access to the old chateau. Normally, you'd want to be using repels and guarantee that you pick up Rotom since it's by far the best encounter you can get. But since Rotom can't evolve, we're stuck with the second best option, which, mind you, is pretty dang good. With both a ghost and fighting type gym coming up, Ghastly is a fantastic pickup. Born from gases? What does that even mean? mean. <laughs> Unlike fighting Mars, facing Jupiter is always a little bit scary. Unlike Mars, Jupiter relies on fishing for critical hits, which in a Nuzlocke is incredibly infuriating. Just like Mars, however, she starts with a Zubat that we can easily take apart with a single confusion. In comes her Skuntank, and Fries is not only cripplingly weak to dark, its only attacking move is Confusion, which can't even hit Skuntank, so I'm forced to swap out, sending in Nuggets to get an Intimidate. But even after the attack drop, a non-crit Night Slash does a whole ton of damage, so I swap out into Meatball. 
Meatball. Unfortunately, Meatball doesn't have magnitude yet, but at least a Night Slash doesn't do too much damage. I should be able to tank another one or two, but then Skuntank gets a critical hit. This has given me flashbacks from my very first run of the channel, when Geodude was also my first death. With my best counter to Skuntank six feet under, I swap out into Burrito, and Flame Wheel does a disappointing amount of damage, but at least Skuntank misses. Because of Burrito's minus attack nature, I try for an Ember, but it just ends up dealing less damage, so I go for Flame Wheel again the next turn, just activating Skuntank Citrus Berry, and healing it almost all the way back up to half. Skuntank knows I hate evasion strats and goes for smoke screen, but luckily I connect with my next flame wheel anyway, taking it down to about a quarter. Skuntank then finally connects with poison gas, which by Pokedex logic should just be a swarm of ghastlies. Regardless, Burrito isn't having any of this evasion tactic nonsense, connecting with the next flame wheel, defeating Skuntank, and thus Jupiter. On Route 206, we've got a fresh chance of finding a ground type, but I end up finding Cheeto the Ponyta. I then head to Wayward Cave to pick up Earthquake when I encounter a Gibble. Even despite not being able to fully evolve it, Gibble's still a pretty good encounter, especially with such early access to Earthquake. Even so, Gabite's stats leave a lot to be desired when compared to Garchomp's almost 200 more. It also doesn't get access to some of Garchomp's great moves like Sword Stance or Dark Coverage like Crunch. And with the level cap at 26, we can also evolve Kale into Haunter. Bandina is definitely a turning point in the difficulty curve of Pokemon Platinum. We're entering the mid game, and even her Duskull with Will-O-Wisp can be tricky to deal with if you don't have an answer. And this fight is actually one of the reasons I picked Chimchar, since Burrito can't get burned. When running the calculations, it was actually pretty unlikely to be able to two-hit KO Duskull with Flame Wheels. And to be honest, I was really hoping to not take it out in two hits, since that way she would waste her Super Potion on Duskull. Haunter is particularly annoying to prepare for, since this thing has both Hypnosis and Confuse Ray. You can't have Lumberries to prepare for both at this point in the game, but she just decides to go for Shadow Claw. Burrito is holding a Chesto Berry, since I felt sleep would be more annoying to deal with, but in this case, I didn't actually have to use it at all. Finally, there's her ace Pokemon, Miss Magius, which is by far the biggest threat to our team. With Confuse Ray, Shadow Ball, Magical Leaf, and Psybeam, it's got some great coverage, and we definitely have to swap out of Burrito, going into Fry's to tank a Psybeam. I'm mostly using Fry's as a pivot switch here, baiting the Shadow Ball so that I can swap into Nuggets and not get hit with my normal typing. We're way better off hitting Miss Magius on the physical side, and this way we won't get hit by its stab. Of course, this means she'll annoyingly resort to status, using Confuse Ray. This we can at least somewhat prepare for by using a Person Berry to get rid of the first confusion. I then go for the super effective Thief, but more importantly than dealing damage, I steal its Citrus Berry. I was very happy to see Psybeam instead of Confusion, but unfortunately, she gets the Psybeam Confusion. This is just my luck in a nutshell, and of course Nuggets hits herself in Confusion, which at least activates Citrus Berry to get some health back. Not feeling so lucky, I decide to swap out into Fries and then pivot back. This way, I can get rid of the Confusion, and if it goes for Psybeam, I probably won't get confused. If it goes for Confuse Ray, it still felt like a better play since there's a chance that it'll miss. Spoiler alert, the turn after I switch in, I'm not that lucky. At least this time, I managed to break through Confusion and deal a bit of damage with Wing Attack, but it's not looking like a second one would take Miss Magis out. I decided to do the same thing again, swapping into Fries and then back into Nuggets to get rid of my Confusion. And this time, instead of going for Confuse Ray, Miss Magis does go for Psybeam, but of course I get confused again. I didn't even know that Psybeam could confuse. I've never seen that happen before. Nuggets does break through Confusion, but doesn't quite manage to take Miss Magis out. This means she uses that Super Potion that I didn't manage to get rid of versus Duskull. Finally, after hitting myself in Confusion, Miss Magis turns Nuggets into a Caesar salad with a Magical Leaf. That really sucks, since it also means we've lost our only Thief user. At this point, I'm forced to send in Taco, which is not ideal since it's weak to Psybeam. It of course immediately confuses me with Confuse Ray, which I can at least get rid of with a Person Berry and fire back with a super effective Bite, which deals a ton of damage. But then it goes for Confuse Ray again, and a part of me just knew that this wasn't gonna work out. Taco tries to go for the win, but very predictably, it hurts itself in Confusion. Taco should be able to tank one non-crit Psybeam, and at least this time, it won't have a chance to confuse me. Taco goes for the win one more time, but once again, she hits herself in confusion. This time, I've got to swap out, and none of my options are good, so I swap out into Kale. Of course, also weak to Psybeam, Kale should at least be able to tank a non-crit, and thank Arceus, I don't get confused again. We're then only able to outspeed with priority Sucker Punch, and collect the third gym badge. That was rough. With Nuggets fallen, I needed to replace her, so I did a lot of running around in Heart Home City to max out Badu's friendship, and evolve it into 
Roselia. I then head to the Lost Tower, and because I already have Ghastly and Zubat, the only encounter I can find is Stake the Duskull. The same goes for Route 210, where Dupes Claws means my only valid encounter is Scyther. And with those two added to the roster, our team is spoiled for choice when it comes to facing Maylene's fighting types. I lead with Taco, who with her flying poison type also quad resists fighting. On top of that, she simply one-shots both Metatite and Machoke with a single wing attack each. The latter was a crit, making my life a little bit easier, but even after a critical hit Rock Tomb, we would have been able to survive and outspeed the Machoke to take it out with a second wing attack. Lucario's last, so I swap out into Pizza, but that Metal Claw deals a lot of damage, and I really don't want to lose my Gabite to a crit, since that would pretty much auto-lose the run. I decide to switch back to Taco, who I should have just stayed in with in the first place, since it can't really hit us with any good moves. Yeah, after the first Metal Claw, we are still in range of a crit, but it's a freaking Lucario. When are we not going to be in range of a crit? The second Metal Claw doesn't get a crit, though, which basically means Taco soloed Maylene all by herself with a quick cameo from Pizza. Heading south, I enter the Maniac Tunnel, where the only encounter we can get is Hippopotas. I also found a Hound Hour just outside on Route 214, which I seem to have failed to record. I was very proud of the name Hot Dog, and I just wanted to say that. Anyway, before challenging Wake, I made my way to Trophy Garden. Because of the dupes clause, the only encounter we can get here is either Pichu or Pikachu. This is the reason I was so bummed to use Nuggets, since I taught her the only Thief TM you get throughout the entire game. You see, the only way to get a Light Ball is to steal it from a wild Pikachu, which it only holds like 5% of the time. But because Pichu is so much more common than Pikachu here, the plan was to capture a Pichu and then evolve it into Pikachu, and from there just try to run into a wild Pikachu and steal a light ball from it with Thief. Funny enough, I do actually end up running into Pikachu as my first non-dupes encounter. However, without Thief to get us a light ball, it's just not gonna be a very good Pokemon. That is unless the one you catch just happens to be holding one. And light ball Pikachu is exactly what the doctor ordered since our next opponent is Wake. Oh, you got a big bad Gyarados? Well, I got a Thunderbolt with your name on it. He then tries to get the type advantage with a ground type, but I taught the Grass Knot TM that we got from Gardenia to Hamburger, which with doubled power from Light Ball is enough to clean one-hit KO Quagsire. Floatzel is last, and because its strongest water move is Brine, it goes for Crunch, which can't ever KO Hamburger with a non-crit. It's a little bit risky, but well worth it, because when do you ever get to see a Pikachu solo a gym in a hardcore Nuzlocke? Before we can challenge the next gym leader, we have to run a few errands in Celestic Town, where we battle Cyrus. In this first Platinum exclusive battle, he's pretty pathetic, and I even forgot that he leads with Sneasel, but a quick switch to Burrito, and I simply handle it with a Mach Punch. His other two Pokemon are flying types who get taken care of anime style. In fact, the most important thing I do in Celestic Town is talk to this glasses guy that gives you black glasses, wise glasses, and choice specs at different times of day. Once we've made it to Canalave City, we have a mandatory battle with Barry, and this point in the game is where we mostly start facing fully evolved Pokemon. Even so, Barry wasn't the toughest cookie to crack, since a lot of our Pokemon have great matchups into his. I did forget Empoleon has area and subsequently lost Salad, which I'm not so proud of, but Salad's been useless so far. This did make it very simple to take out Empoleon the next turn with Pizza, but the fact that his final Pokemon had to be a Roserade felt a little bit rude. We next need to prepare for Byron, so I grabbed Cheeto and Hot Dog from the box and evolved Porkchop into Machoke. At this point in the game, you would usually have an Infernape, which makes this gym incredibly easy. Monferno, on the other hand, does not pack the same firepower, so instead I lead with Pizza to take out his Magneton with an Earthquake. His second Pokemon is Steelix, and because this is a Gabite, I doubt that we'll be able to one-shot it with an Earthquake, so I swap out into Cheeto to tank the Ice Fang. Steelix defense may be good, but on the special side, it leaves a bit to be desired. So I go for a Stab Fire Blast, and Cheeto is about to demonstrate why this challenge is about to get so much more difficult from this point on. Basically, any fully evolved Fire Pokemon would melt Steelix with a Fire Blast. Ponyta, to be completely fair, is a physical attacker, but even so, it should be able to knock out a Steelix. At this point, it's safe to send in pizza, since Byron is guaranteed to go for a full restore at such low health. This means I'll get to use two Earthquakes in a row, which definitely guarantees a KO. However, I just end up getting a critical hit, so I only needed to use one. With Steelix out of the way, we only have to face Bastiodon, but this thing is incredibly tricky with Metal Burst. Once again, Gabite is just not strong enough to get a one-hit KO, and I really couldn't risk it going for Metal Burst there, since that would guarantee 
he'd take me out. Instead, I send in Pork Chop and go for a Cross Chop, which does about half even after an Iron Defense. This activates Bastiodon's Citrus Berry, which means another one won't be enough, especially not after a second Iron Defense. I go for Low Kick since Bastiodon's so heavy, but realistically, I should have gone for Cross Chop since it has a high critical hit ratio. This time, however, it does go for Metal Burst, taking Pork Chop down to half, so I'm forced to swap out, going into Hot Dog. Bastiodon just goes for Taunt, but I was always planning to attack. Hot Dog connects with the Fire Blast, and even though Bastiodon has such huge special defense at such low- Yeah, Hot Dog just barely failed to do the job. And the further we get into the game, the bigger the gap between our non-fully evolved Pokemon and these absolute behemoths we're facing is going to be. I really thought Byron would full restore here, which is why I went for another Fire Blast, which if that would have missed, could have been very bad. Before we get to head north towards Snowpoint City, we have to face a few Team Galactic goons, but luckily they're not very difficult to beat. I then reach Acuity Lakefront, where I'm really hoping to pick up a Swina, but my encounter's a Sneasel. Without being able to evolve, this thing really isn't that great, but it actually might be useful for the next gym badge. Going into the fight versus Candace, this is once again a gym that a fully evolved Infernape could easily solo. From Inferno, that's not quite the case. We still send him out first and go for a Mach Punch to take out her Sneasel since it's quad effective. She then sends in her Piloswine, and I really didn't want to miss a Fire Blast here, so I decided to just swap out into Pork Chop. This does mean Pork Chop gets hit by an Earthquake, but he can just barely tank it above half health. This is very useful since Piloswine is somehow faster than Machoke, despite being a big pile of pig. As long as it's a non-critical hit, we can survive this hit deep into the red and go for a cross chop that will never miss because of no guard. It even ends up getting a critical hit that doesn't matter whatsoever. What's perfect about beating Piloswine with Machoke is it baits out Frostlass since she has Psychic. It is a little bit unfortunate the Pork Chop is at only 11 HP because this way Frostlass can KO with any move and goes for Shadow Ball instead of Psychic. It still barely does any Anything to ramen the Sneasel, but then Frostlass tries to get cheeky and boost its evasion with Double Team. This is like the one time in history that Sneasel's terrible move pool actually comes in handy. Faint Attack just happens to be the best dark move that Sneasel has access to at level 44. It's just a coincidence that it happens to be the perfect tool to fight an evasive Frostlass since it can't ever miss. Frostlass also only has Ice, Psychic, and Ghost moves to hit me with, which basically leaves it zero good options. Once Frostlass falls, she's only left with Obama Snow, so I swear swap out of ramen into burrito and get hit by a wood hammer. From there, a simple quad effective zoom lens fire blast is all it takes to finish the fight. Now that I can use rock climb in the overworld, I use a repel to get to the grass at Lake Acuity. I really wanted to get a swine up here, but not only is swine up not available in this area, every single one of the encounters is a dupe. So instead, I head to Fuego Ironworks, where I capture Candy the Magnemite. From here, we gotta prepare for the Team Galactic Endgame, which starts with us taking on Cyrus a second time in the Galactic Building, but in this fight, he doesn't have his final team, and we get through fairly easily. From there, I start to assemble the team I want to bring to Spear Pillar, which requires me to evolve Candy into Magneton. But before we can face Cyrus in the final showdown, we have to take on Mars and Jupiter at the same time in a multi-battle with Big Boy. This being a multi-battle, it can be incredibly unpredictable and very difficult to plan for. I decide to lead with the newly acquired Candy and give it the choice specs to deal a ton of damage to both Bronzors with Discharge. The one obvious downside to this tactic is I of course hit my my own teammate, but in this case, Munchlax is one of the least useful Pokemon on Barry's team, so if I can get rid of it more quickly, I see that as a good thing. The Bronzors then set up dual screens, which annoyingly is going to make it a lot more difficult to deal damage to their team, and Munchlax just stockpiles. The next turn, I fire off a second Specs Discharge, and luckily, the first one dealt enough damage that I can take out both Bronzors even after the screens. As an added bonus, I also take out Munchlax. As much as I would have loved to see the two Golbats here, the commanders send out Perugly and Scum tank. Perugly then uses Slash on Big Boy's Rapidash, which, despite not getting a crit, actually deals a ton of damage. Rapidash's takedown, on the other hand, is pretty pathetic. Even though I know the Skun Tank has Flamethrower, it is a physical attacker, so I decide to stay in and go for Discharge, which deals a ton of damage to Perugly, activating its Citrus Berry. It just straight up takes Rapidash out, but if it's committed to not going for Flare Blitz, good riddance. They do still have Light Screen up, so Skun Tank doesn't even take half, and then it fires back with a Flamethrower, which deals a lot more damage than I was expecting 
expecting. Finally, Big Boy sends in Star Raptor, which is perfect timing since it lowers both of Perugly and Skuntank's attack. Candy's just dead to another flamethrower here, so I swap out into Burrito. Perugly tries for a hypnosis, but very fortunately misses. Star Raptor then goes for super effective close combat, which finally takes out the Perugly. It also makes Star Raptor a very unreliable ally after it drops both its physical and special defense. Skuntank then very predictably goes for that flamethrower again, but because we swapped out, it barely does anything. At the end of the turn, Mars sends in her final Pokemon, Golbat. Because its only flying type move is Air Cutter, I figure I can stay in with Burrito here and try and go for some damage. Staraptor annoyingly goes for takedown here and not something like fly or close combat, which just triggers Skuntank's Citrus Berry. Burrito then connects with a Fire Blast, but it's just barely not enough to take Skuntank out. Golbat then goes for the Air Cutter, leaving Burrito at about half and Staraptor at a range where a Flamethrower from Skuntank is enough to take it out. Big Boy is already down to his fifth Pokemon, Heracross. And in this case, it's got a pretty terrible matchup against two Golbats and a flame-throwing Skuntank. In fact, pathetically, it immediately gets crit by a quad effective air cutter, taking it down in one shot. Which means after Hamburger's hit by a smoke screen, Big Boy's down to his final Pokemon, Empoleon. Finally, he does something useful, taking out Skuntank with a priority Aqua Jet before it can do anything else. Golbat then decides to make this that kind of battle and confuses Pikachu. Jupiter then sends in her Golbat, and because of my prior luck with confusion in this run, I decide to swap out and send in my Golbat. She barely takes any damage, even from a critical hit Poison Fang. Jupiter's Golbat pathetically goes for a Giga Drain against Empoleon, which also barely does anything. Big Boy's Empoleon then gets an attack boost off its Metal Claw, so it can now hit itself harder in confusion. Taco deals a bit of damage with a Wing Attack, and then of course Empoleon gets confused. Then after another pathetic Giga Drain, everything comes full circle, and Empoleon hits itself in the face. With all this confusion nonsense going on, I decide to first take out the one Golbat with a Fly, and then then swap out into Candy to finally be done with this always infuriating battle with a Discharge. As an added bonus, I do take out Empoleon as well with the Discharge, so it's kind of like I defeated Barry too. But that's just the Team Galactic warm-up, since now we have to face one of the most difficult fights in all of Platinum. Cyrus is one of those fights you always have to plan for, and with only unevolved Pokemon, this is going to be particularly difficult. For his Houndoom, I had to go back to Route 201 to defeat as many Starlies as possible and get pizza to max speed. Once we're faster, it's simply a matter of pressing super effective Earthquake and we don't have to deal with Houndoom anymore. With Pizza's quad weakness to ice, this will bait in his ace Weavile. And obviously, there's an ice punch incoming here, so we can fairly freely swap out into Burrito. However, because we're a Monferno, we still take a whole ton of damage from this resisted hit. And if we were an Infernape, this would be an incredibly easy KO with Mach Punch. But in this case, Mach Punch doesn't actually do enough despite being quad effective, so I'm forced to go for close combat combat and eat another Ice Punch. Once Weavile goes down, he sends in Gyarados, which means we once again need to switch out. With either an Earthquake or Waterfall inbound, I swap out into Taco, who dodges the Earthquake. This way, I can guarantee it'll never go for Earthquake as I swap into Hamburger. In fact, it just ends up missing an Ice Fang as I switch, so Hamburger gets to take out the Gyarados for free with a Thunderbolt the following turn. Conveniently, Cyrus now only has Honchkrow and Crobat left, which just allows me to take out Honchkrow as soon as it comes in with another Thunderbolt. Crobat decides to be a little bit trickier and once again subjects me to confusion. And with my luck, of course I end up hitting myself, which deals a ton of damage because of the light ball. It's really not worth risking a second hit here, especially when we have Candy at full health in the back that resists every single one of Crobat's moves. The best thing Cyrus can hope to do is go for a flinch with Air Slash, but that doesn't even work out and a Specs Discharge takes Crobat out for the win. The final boss fight in our way before we can take on the Pokemon League is the Electric-type Gym Leader, Volkner. And if you've ever had a Garchomp on your team when challenging this gym, you know how easy it can be. It turns out it doesn't really make a difference. As long as you have enough speed EVs on your Gabite and give it a life orb, there's really nothing Volkner can do to stop you since his Luxray doesn't even have Intimidate to slow you down. And with that, my team of underdogs had made it all the way to the Pokemon League. And one of the Pokemon I really wanted to bring was Stake the Duskull, so I evolved it into Dusclops. Because with such a severely limiting restriction, I knew I needed to bring the best of the best I had. First, I brought my starter, Burrito with Close Combat, Mach Punch, Fire Blast, and Flare Blitz, which hopefully can prove to be useful against Eren and some of Cynthia's Pokemon. Fries the Kadabra with Hidden Power, Shadow Ball, Shockwave, and Psychic. With Hidden Power Rock, we could need it in a dire situation versus Eren, but I plan to replace it with Energy Ball as soon as we face Bertha. Candy the Magneton with Thunderbolt, Thunder Wave, Charge Beam, and Flash Cannon. With its Steel Typing, this thing will be a great defensive Pokemon to have on the team. And speaking of defensive Pokemon, we've got Stake the Dusclops with Protect, Curse, will and Shadow Punch. Without this thing, we 
we've got a terrible matchup into Bertha's Gliscor. Pizza the Gabite with Earthquake, Rockslide, Dragon Claw, and Substitute. Could come in handy versus Eren, and hopefully it can sweep Flint just like a Garchomp. Finally, Hamburger the Pikachu with Grass Knot, Quick Attack, Hidden Power Dragon, and Thunderbolt. And once I step through these doors, there's no going back. Our first opponent is Eren the Bug-type Master, and the biggest thing we have going for us in this fight is the level difference. With the level cap set, so we get to enter the Elite Four with our Pokemon matching Lucian's highest level Pokemon in level sets us at 59. On top of that, our team is pretty well set up to tackle Bug. His first Pokemon, Yon Mega, tries to set up with Evasion Strats versus Candy, but I end up hitting a Thunderbolt the very first turn, and even without choice specs, this would be a very easy one-hit KO. This of course baits in Heracross, which can very easily take out Candy with a close combat, so I swap out to Stake to dodge up with the Ghost type. This is not a perfect counter, however, since it does have the super effective Night Slash, which at least wouldn't take us out, even if it crit, and we can burn it with Will-O-Wisp. This makes this Heracross a lot less scary, and I decide to pivot out into Candy as it connects with another Night Slash. The reason I do this is to avoid getting hit by a Night Slash as I swap into Fries. This way, I'm expecting a resisted close combat, but very oddly, the Heracross goes for a resisted Stone Edge into Candy. And even with the burn, if that Stone Edge would have crit, that would have probably been the end of the run right there. Luckily, Fries gets to stay alive and take out Heracross with a Psychic. Scizor comes in next, and this thing is spoiled for choice when it comes to ways of taking out Fries, so I swap out into Burrito, who tanks an Iron Head. I then really don't want to miss an 80% accurate Fire Blast, so I go for a Flare Blitz, which also guarantees the KO and the accuracy. It does leave us taking a lot of recoil damage, but we can't stay in against Drapion anyway, so I swap out into Pizza to tank this Aerial Ace. Drapion is actually exceptionally bulky, and this is one of those cases where I needed to equip Pizza with a Life Orb despite all the investment into attack I have, otherwise this super effective Earthquake wouldn't be a KO 100% of the time. However, with the Life Orb, I don't have to sweat the roll whatsoever, and we face the final Pokemon Vespaquen. Once again, I really didn't feel like challenging the odds and going for a Rock Slide, which definitely would have KO'd, so I take the safe route out and swap into Candy, which resists all of Vespaquen's moves and guaranteeing our victory with a Choice Specs Thunderbolt. Going into the second Elite Four battle versus Bertha, I was really only worried about her Gly score. With both Insane Bulk and Stab Earthquake plus every Elemental Fang, that thing is very dangerous. Before I got to face it, however, Bertha very kindly sent in all four of her other Pokemon. To deal with them, all I had to do was equip Fries with a Choice Specs and destroy them all with Energy Balls. Then in comes Gliscor, and because of its flying type, it's not weak to Energy Balls, so it doesn't end up being a one-shot. I go through with the plan and send in Steak, who unfortunately instantly gets critical hit by an Earthquake. This would be incredibly bad for Steak if she wasn't holding a Citrus Berry to get a bit of health back. It's not enough to tank another crit, but at least lets her survive another regular Earthquake and then fire back with a Will-O-Wisp. I then take a turn to go for Protect just to rack up a little bit more burn damage before swapping out into Pizza. I do this in order to bait Gliscor into going for Ice Fang, which is way less powerful than its Stab Earthquake as I swap out into Fries. This way, even if Gliscor crits, Fries won't go down. And now that the burn has taken the Gliscor below half health, we can very easily take Gliscor down with a Spec Psychic. A little bit scarier than I was hoping, but still a very clean battle. As for Flint, the guy is Volkner's best friend, and so I really ought to give him the same treatment. Without Gabite on the team, this fight would be an absolute nightmare. But as it stands, we've got enough speed EVs to outspeed every single one of his Pokemon, and not a single one of them has the bulk to withstand a Stab Earthquake, granting us a very easy victory. But with Flint defeated, we've got two very difficult fights ahead of us. Which is why it's so painful to press B on this evolution. Speaking of Lucian, this man used to end all of my Sinnoh Nuzlocke's when I was a kid, but at least for his first couple Pokemon, we've got a secret weapon. Once again, Kadabra proves that it's a very competent team member even without evolving into Alakazam. With a pair of choice specs, we very simply take out Alakazam and Espeon with a single Shadow Ball each. Bronzong comes in third, and it's much bulkier, but I know I can tank one Gyro Ball, so I decide to just stay in and fire off another Shadow Ball, dealing way over half and even getting a special defense drop. This actually works out really nicely, since it goes for Calm Mind, boosting its special defense back to neutral and just allowing me to take it out with another Shadow Ball the following turn. From here we face, by far the biggest issue on his team, Gallade. Because of its huge special defense, one Shadow Ball isn't enough to take it out, and its moveset full of high critical hit ratio moves is incredibly scary. The Leaf Blade as I switch isn't a critical hit, which means that even if the second one was, I could still survive it and get to fire off my Will-O-Wisp. Now that we got this thing burned, it's a lot more manageable. Just like versus Gliscor, I go for Protect, just to get that extra bit of burn damage. I then stay in and let Gallade hit me with a Psycho Cut, which because of the burn, can't 
KO me even with a critical hit. I then go for a Shadow Punch, which at first I was scared dealt a little bit too much damage and would trigger a full restore the next turn, but a Citrus Berry puts it in exactly the right range. Now that Gallade's both burned and low on health, I can swap out into Fry's. She perfectly switches into a resisted Psycho Cut, which would have been fine even as a critical hit. Because of the choice specs, I'm forced to lock myself into a move, so I go for the super effective Shadow Ball, since Lucian's final Pokemon is Fry's worst enemy, Alakazam. But Fry's came prepared for this moment with just enough speed EVs to outpace her elder. She connects with a super effective Specs Shadow Ball, taking out the Alakazam, and man, does that feel good. And so, with some sound strategy, my team of not fully evolved friends had made it all the way to the champion. But could their combined strength possibly be enough to beat one of the most infamously strong champions of all time? Going into the fight versus Cynthia, I was incredibly worried. Her Pokemon are both powerful and bulky, and what mine lack in power, they equally lack in bulk. And if we didn't have candy, we'd be in very big trouble just facing Spiritomb. I start the fight with a Wise Lass's boosted Thunderbolt, which deals a lot more damage than I was expecting and takes Spiritomb down below half. Shadow Ball then lowers Candy's special defense, but once we take out Spiritomb the next turn with a Thunderbolt, we're definitely not going to want to stay in with Candy since her next Pokemon is Garchomp. But going into the fight, I had a plan, and I was going to stick to it. Obviously, I swap out a candy to get out of the way of the incoming earthquake and send in steak. Cynthia goes for an earthquake, and I'm really hoping to survive it well enough in order to survive a second one. But this is where my plan starts to reek of copium. The worst part is, if Steak didn't get crit, she would have gotten enough health back from a Citrus Berry to survive another one and burn the Garchomp. And you know a run is over when you plan to fight Cynthia's Garchomp with a Gabite. Yes, with all of his EVs, Pizza was faster, but despite so many EVs into attack as well, Pizza doesn't even get close to taking Garchomp out and just activating its Citrus Berry, getting Garchomp back to a comfortable amount of health. With everything Pizza had done for this run, I couldn't think of a less dignified way to go than to die to Cynthia's Garchomp. Except Pizza does it! Pizza survives the earthquake! And with its full might, Pizza launches a Dragon Claw to finally kill the mother. Wait, no, 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 you can't just pull me back and forth like this, no! <laughs> She goes for Dragon Rush. Why would she go for Dragon Rush? Any other move, Earthquake, even Flamethrower for all I care, and that's a dub for Cynthia. But the woman is crazy. She wants to flex on me by going for Dragon Rush and suffers the consequences. Because she full restores and Pizza's faster, I'm allowed to use two moves in a row. And with those two Dragon Claws, Pizza, like fries before him, has defeated his superior. But that's when it hits me. While this was a huge W for my not fully evolved Pokemon, Cynthia still has four Pokemon left. The first of those being Milotic. I swap Candy into the obvious Ice Beam, who instantly gets frozen. I mean, that's exactly my luck, but in this case, it didn't matter that much since Candy can't withstand the following surf. I was really hoping it could, because Hamburger most likely can't one-shot the Milotic even with the light ball. There's no other play. I have to just send it. Come on, Pikachu. And Pikachu does it! The son of a bun does it! But this fight still isn't over. Cynthia sends in her Roserade, so I swap out of Hamburger and send in Burrito. We're getting hit by an Energy Ball here, and we can definitely tank the resisted hit, but it all comes down to if Burrito has enough speed EVs to outspeed. And thank Arceus he does. But defeating Roserade with this Flare Blitz comes at a very steep cost. The recoil from this move will put Burrito in range of being taken out by an extreme speed from Luke. Lucario. With that in mind, there's really no point in swapping out against this Togekiss. And so, I let my starter Burrito go out in a blaze of glory. It's not a crazy amount of damage, but it might just be exactly what we need. Togekiss then launches the Aura Sphere that spells the end for our starter. But with his final move, Burrito did a very important job. Togekiss is a very specially defensive Pokemon, and without that damage, Hamburger can't get a one-hit KO without a critical hit. But with the help from Burrito, Burrito's Flare Blitz, it's a guaranteed knockout. Finally, Cynthia's left with only Lucario, but things are still unsure. I once again have to just go for it. Hamburger fires off a Thunderbolt, and with the Light Ball, it might very well be enough damage. Lucario isn't a very bulky Pokemon, but in the end, 
Pikachu just isn't strong enough. As I watch Hamburger's health fall all the way down to zero, I have a horrifying realization. With pizza left at 11 HP and fries being so physically frail, there's a decent chance that they both just go down to one extreme speed each. There was only one thing that could save the run, and all I could do was pray. Cynthia fell precisely into my trap. With an extreme speed, she could have possibly won the match, but going for a full restore was digging her own grave, allowing me to go for an earthquake, which is way more than enough to finish off Lucario. And so I'd done it. I'd beat a Pokemon Platinum Hardcore Nuzlocke using only not fully evolved Pokemon. And I gotta say, this was one of the most fun and refreshing challenges I've done in a really long time. So if you guys wanna see me attempt this type of challenge in a a different main series game, let me know down in the comments. And of course, until we see each other next time. <laughs>